Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Kempler, and I'm from the MathWorks. And today you're here for the webinar on developing quantitative skills using geoscience data with MATLAB. Welcome. Uh, I'll be co-presenting with three professors, uh, Charlie Bank, Andy Fisher, and Jacqueline Kapl Kaplan-Auerbach, uh, respectively from University of Toronto, University of Tasmania, and Western Washington University. Thank you to the presenters for uh, doing this today. It's great. Um, and presumably most of you are geoscience educators who are here to learn more about how to present and uh, teach um, ge uh, computational concepts with MATLAB in the geoscience area. So I'll get started and launch in here. Um, oh, by the way, uh, one thing before I get started is I want to mention that if you do have questions, please put them into the chat. Uh, two things, if you put questions into the chat, we'll uh, try to get them answered either during the session or after during the Q&A. And second, you might notice that um, Monica and Alice will be posting links that are mentioned during the uh, webinar so that you can actually go to those links if you're interested while the presentation is going on to explore the particular areas that we're talking about. Okay, so watch your chat for information. Okay. Okay, so the session goals today are at a high level. Uh, to talk to you about resources that are available for teaching computation and geoscience. And that means uh, using data and simulations and models, sometimes code models, with using MATLAB as a vehicle to do that. And one of the ways that we'll be teaching you to do that is by way of three specific teaching activities that will highlight and address some of the common challenges that uh, geoscience educators find when they're trying to teach quantitative skills or teach computation relative to solving quantitative problems. And uh, while the, the, uh, the uh, presenters are talking about these activities, they'll actually be talking at the same time about the strategies that they're using to teach visualization and analysis and also the challenge that, that their strategy is meant to address, the, the, the aspects of the, of the subject matter that the students sometimes struggle with and how they're looking to um, get over that hurdle with them. Now, another resource that you'll be learning about today is uh, the community. What you're seeing some of the community in action today by seeing us, the presenters, and, and these educators who are, are expert in this. But also, we'll explain to you how you can use the resources that are out there to be part of the community and perhaps either contribute your own ideas or continue to ask questions even beyond the webinar of this community and, and, and use that as a way to develop your uh, educational materials for, for your classes. Okay. Okay. So those are the session goals. What I'm going to do now is talk about some of the MATLAB resources that are already available on the CERC website. And as you can see, CERC and AGT and MathWorks are collaborating on this uh, webinar and, and are, have also collaborated on some other, other things that you'll be seeing. So I will get to the resources now. And after I'm finished, we'll, uh, the, the, Andy, Ch uh, Charlie, and, and Jackie will run through the three teaching activities that, uh, that, I, um, that, I, that they're uh, going to cover. OK? OK. So where this all came from, or part of where this came from, is a workshop that was held last October in 2015. And the topic of the workshop was teaching geoscience with MATLAB. And uh, the workshop. Um, had actually three di three different things that are still useful to you as resources. One is the program itself, which I'll, I'll show you. The attendees, some of those attendees are Charlie, Andy, and Jackie, so those attendees are actually resources for you. And then we'll show some of the materials that are created. Among those materials are these teaching activities, but there's more beyond that. And so I'll be giving you a quick overview of these resources to give you a feel for what's available um, as a result of the workshop. So first, if you um, wanted to read about the workshop, which obviously happened already, you could go to the workshop page. But perhaps more interesting than the workshop page itself, which introduces the idea of the workshop, is uh, the program. And if you see over here, I'll, OK. If you see over here, see it says Teaching with MATLAB 2015. That's the high-level workshop link. And as you go down, you see it says outcomes and overview and program. So now we're looking at program. And essentially, if you wanted to read through this, you could see what the workshop attendees experienced to some degree. You could see the presentation that I gave to kick it off. 
for example. You could see a presentation by Frederick Simons from Princeton where he talks about how to teach computation to students and etc. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But if you went there, you'd be able to get a sense of what we did, but also actually view some of the content as if you had been there, perhaps. Um, here you see the attendees. Perhaps you know some of these people. You see they look pretty happy. That's either because they're punchy after two days of doing this or just because uh, they're having fun learning about how to teach. And, and we did have a good time learning from each other. And I, again, I bring these people, I bring these, bring this up and show you these people because um, these are some of the resources available to you to learn from and to continue to reach out to. Um, they're interested in, in continuing to build the community. So I recommend that you. Um, Think about who from these people are in your field and who you might want to reach out to. Um, so there is a page that uh, is separate from the workshop specifically uh, that um, is the Teach in Geoscience with MATLAB page. And it's the high level resource. It's not specific to, to the workshop. It's a, a longer story kind of about MATLAB and we'll get to that in a minute. Here's the link. Down, down here at the bottom of the page. Um, so again, after the session, you can go back and look at that. Um, and on that page, you'll see a bunch of resources. And again, I'll walk through that a little bit. But it's a pretty long list. And so it's something you know you might want to allocate an hour or so to, to walking through that and seeing things like courses and books um, and code examples. And so think, think, uh, think about um, spending some time on that if you're looking to see what resources are out there. Uh, but a second thing, that's the main resource page. The workshop outcomes, this is the main page for that. And you can see it's laid out with links to all kinds of interesting things. And I will take a minute to show, to walk you through that to give you a sense of how you might um, use it as a resource when you, when you go, go to it. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to actually go to that resource page for MATLAB and the and the uh, the, the larger uh, pedagogy page that I just showed, and show you what that feels like. So to do that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, and um, actually click on this. I know you can't see it yet. I'm getting set up, and I'm going to stop sharing the slides, but I'm going to share my screen, so you should be able to see my web browser in just a second. Okay. I'm hoping people can see that. Um, can someone just tell me that you can see that? Yep, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So if you came to that link that I told you about where it's the MATLAB resource page, if you are f familiar with MATLAB, you might not need to read the section about MATLAB. But if you're not familiar with MATLAB, and apparently a number of people on our call today ha are not familiar with MATLAB, you might want to read about what MATLAB's for. You could read about an, art, uh, an article that MATLAB was used in or a story about how people used it. And then it explains more about how the program is used and how you might get the software at your university or institution. It also talks about things like Cody coursework. Um, Cody coursework is an auto grading program that if your students were submitting code for a course, you might want to set up prog uh, excuse me problems in advance and have have a way to auto grade those problems that the students are submitting as homework. And so we have a, a platform where MathWorks has a platform that we offer to enable you to auto grade your students' homework. Okay, but I mentioned before that there's a resources and references section, meaning specific uh, content about geoscience. And here you see all that. So there's curriculums of various types, there's books, and here it says um, full list of published textbooks. So you could go see all the books that are, are you know, published books. Code example. So let's say I go to the bottom and it says here, videos for introducing MATLAB to undergrads. So let's say I wanted to introduce my undergrads to working with arrays in MATLAB. I thought that was a good idea because arrays are pretty a common, a common way of working in MATLAB. So I click on that, and it starts to talk. Um, so if you thought an eight-minute video was a good way to introduce your students to working with arrays with MATLAB, you could just send them links as part of you know, your course and have them learn MATLAB that way. Um, another thing, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that are available on the MathWorks um, website, is it says here MATLAB product code examples. So if I click on that, I end up again on the MathWorks page, and there are many, many examples for doing all kinds of things, plotting multiple lines, um, exporting cell arrays to text files, you know, etc. So if you wanted a, to get a sense of things that are available to you, available to you for general 
MATLAB learning, each of these is a is a code file um, that anybody can run in MATLAB. So, and you see here all these different areas, signal processing, image processing, there are many kinds of examples. Up to you to decide which ones you'd like to show, okay, or look at. All right, um, so that was the resources page, remember, up here. Um, and so feel free to explore that and see which resources are of interest to you. But the other page that I mentioned is the teaching with data simulations and models using MATLAB. And again, look at the right, left-hand navigation and you'll see teaching with MATLAB. So the reason I'm showing it is just partly so you can see the, the approach and the philosophy that the workshop resulted in and that is intended to help you understanding how to use MATLAB and how to introduce data simulation and models as part of your courses. But also, it's a nice um, sort of switch yard, a way, to, a way to look through the activity. So for example, a big part of what came out of the workshop is teaching uh, the teaching activity collection. So if I click on this, I get a, a list of many teaching activities, where a teaching activity is kind of a component, like maybe to take a, a, core, a, a single class, or maybe it'll take three classes. And you notice here, Jackie, who's speaking to us today, has an activity here. You'll notice Charlie has one here, and that's actually the one he's going to cover. Um, so all the ones we're, we're showing today are here, but so are other ones. And you can see here on the left-hand side a list by topic area. So if, let's say, Jackie's not covering what you do today, maybe somebody else covered something that you do, and you could go over here to this collection and look at all the mineralogy ones um, because that's your area. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how you use the teaching activity section. And th th they really did a nice job of... of laying out um, the activities, uh, so definitely worth looking at. You could look at course descriptions, um, which is also here. And finally, I want to show you one more thing. Um, sometimes people have questions about, you know, how do you teach computation, and why would you teach it, and um, is visualization important, and what about large data? And so uh, the, the website does a nice job of talking about these topics in an organized way. So if you're wondering, Talk to me about computational skills, right? So it, it gets into that discussion and then also provides materials that are related to that topic, such as this presentation from one of the attendees. And then here's the thing I was talking about before. So you can join the community. And, um, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you that later. But what these pages let you click on this, and you can become one of the people who, can receive, who will receive communications from the group. Um, and you can send communications to the group asking questions. And so that's a great way to participate and to learn what it is you need for your course. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to go back now to the slides, I hope. Okay. And I think somebody's bringing them up for us. And here they come. Okay, so this is what I covered. I showed you the MATLAB resources page, and I showed you the outcomes from the workshop with um, all of that teaching with MATLAB material, including teaching activities and other things. And you see here again the NAV um, that you can use to get to all these topics that we just talked about. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do now is hand it over to Charlie, Andy, and Jackie, who are going to talk about these three teaching activities um, that they use in their classes. So, uh, Charlie, are you first? Yep, I I'm guess first. I thought there's another page coming up. Okay, I'll go to another page. I think it might be the next one. There it is. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, thank you, Lisa. This is... Andy Fisher. And the first thing we'll cover here is some of the common challenges of, of, of teaching quantitative skills as kind of an experience from implementing our activities in the classroom. Um, so I'll just start briefly with the, the challenges um, of these uh, just basic computer skills that the students experience. The main thing is uh, reading and writing and, and troubleshooting code and scripts. Uh, Typically students, you know, what do I put in the command line? What do I put in the script? Kind of understanding the window structure of MATLAB and, and where to put their, their commands. Um, one of the more common things is, and surprisingly, is students don't have a sense of directory structure or directory paths on their, on their computer. So where um, in MATLAB do they 
Can they find this information? Where do they have to put their files? How can they write uh, code to point to a particular directory? It's, it's those kinds of things. And um, lastly is taking chances with um, computer-based learning programs. So just you know, alerting them to the fact that when they load data into MATLAB, they're not going to uh, corrupt their original data file. That, that MATLAB will work independent of that data file. Um, so that there won't be any problems uh, corrupting any of their other files. Um, so we've also identified, sorry, this is Jackie, and um, we've also identified a number of challenges that students uh, experience in terms of the data analysis. And some of those kind of have to do with the concepts behind the data. So it might be understanding what these equations mean that they're using, be it in MATLAB or any other context. Um, helping them understand that there's a physical process behind that equation, um, sometimes working with those equations and describing them in words or graphing, uh, graphing them and describing that graph can help them understand what that process is about. But sometimes there's a disconnect between those two things. Um, helping students under, under, uh, recognize that sometimes what you need are many types of data to address a problem and that we can combine these things. MATLAB is a great way, tool that we can use to help combine different types of data um, and image them and analyze them together. Um, again, with plotting and reading, you know, MATLAB is a great tool for having students uh, visualize their data. That's a big part of what um, we often ask them to do. Um, but students often really struggle with the graph understanding what does this mean? What is the dependent variable? What does it mean that this is the independent variable? How can we describe the relationship between those two things? That can sometimes be a struggle uh, for students who have you know, less experience describing it. Um, and finally, figuring out kind of what things they can do that are useful, what approaches they can take, and then whether an answer is reasonable if they get you know, an answer that tells them a tectonic plate is moving at four times the speed of sound. That should be identifiable as a problematic response. And how students sometimes struggle to recognize that they know more than their computer, and they are the ones who ultimately will evaluate that answer to see if it's a reasonable thing um, and not simply trust the numbers that come out of it. Thanks, Jackie. And this is Charlie from Toronto speaking. And one thing that I really like about MATLAB working with my students is that, that it's really easy to visualize the data. And in particular, like we often as geoscientists work with complex data, so 3D data or directional data like um, ocean currents, for example, complex temporal data like things that change over time and then we can produce movies. Um, so, so that's really something that, that I like about MATLAB, and that will be also the activity that I will show you has to do with visualization. Before I move forward, though, I do want to remind you that there is the chat box, so if you have questions, please feel free to put them in so we can get to them later on. The activity I want to show you is one that I use in a second year course, where it's in a structural geology course that helps students to visualize outcrop patterns from strike dip data. And, um, because one of the goals of the course is that students learn to read what we call read a map, so to infer the 3D subsurface structure from a map, which is really like a 2D surface representation. The, core, the course is one of our core courses that all of our geoscience um, majors and, and minors need to take. And um, the course is also taken by mineral engineering students and then we have some students who also take it just for interest. And the course typically has about 90 students enrollment, and then the students are split into like three lab sections that are run by, by TAs, and I kind of float around to the three different rooms. I put here just like a snapshot of the, of the syllabus. If I get this, the arrow. So just that you see, so we start off in the term with like topographic maps and cross sections, and then the dipping layers, that's the, the second lab, and from there we move on to, to more complicated, like unconformities, folds, faults, and then fabrics and all that. So in that second, second lab, it's, a, it's kind of a package that I give my students. We have a few of these styrofoam models to um, show how
we show how the um, an outcrop pattern looks like, the interaction basically between the surface topography and uh, geologic boundaries. They do a pen and paper exercise, and here in the middle is like my solution, so usually they get like the, the map and then they have to create the cross section down here with um, like a protractor and ruler and pencils and all the colored pencils. And then the MATLAB exercise is an online module, and that's, this is shown here on the right side. And then also part of the exercise will be to actually look at a real map. That module was developed a few years ago by two of my undergraduate students that since have graduated. It's coded in MATLAB and uses the graphical user interface and runtime commands so that students can actually download it as a package and run it without having a MATLAB license. And this is what the screenshot of that looks like. So I need to get the arrow in again. So it gives you these two images. On the left side is a, is a map, and it shows an, an outcrop pattern. And on the right side is the same scenario shown in, in 3D. And the exercise is based on one that students do from a lab book. So if I, if I go back, it's actually this exercise here. So the, the surface topography is, is exactly this, this, um, this surface topography that they do in their map. So the idea is that they actually they will find out the strike and dip, and then they can actually go in and, and model that in, in MATLAB, and then also play around and change strike and dip and see how the outcrop pattern changes. So, but, but the key is that the students will not um, it, it, the math, math behind it is actually not visible to the students. But in other courses, I've actually made it transparent and showed it because the math is not very complicated. The topography is gridded. The strike dip values define a plane, and that plane is also gridded. And then those two um, surfaces are matrices in MATLAB, and I can just create the difference and then create the zero contour, and that's the outcrop pattern. And then once they ran through that, then this is the, what, I'm, what they do currently. So that they look at this map here from Colorado, and there's the, these nice hogbacks here that are um, <coughs> layers. There's the Google Earth activity that I connected to that. So there's the air photo with it, then superimposed on that, like draped over it, the geology. And then they can also look at it as a perspective view to, to recognize that indeed that these units are dipping. Alice, if you could give me control to my um, desktop, then I can show the, the activity. So I click on share my screen. So this is, this is the activity. So up here, I can put in like a, say I put in a strike of 45 degrees, and I put in a dip of of 10 degrees, I set that, I get these crosshairs, and I can click on somewhere on the map where these values have been measured, and now it calculates. So there's the outcrop pattern here on the left side, and then on the right side I have the hole, and I can move this around so I can see from the top here, and you see that there I can then the students realize that, well, the outcrop pattern is actually where the where the unit is below, so where you see the colors here, the unit is obviously below, where it's black, the unit is, would be in the air, so it has been eroded away. And then we can also look kind of like this, a long strike, and, um, and so students hopefully get an idea. And then we can, for example, change, let's change that like to 120 degrees, and I set that, and I can do that again, click about the same area, and then they see that how, how things have changed. And with that, I can pass on to Andy. Thank you, Charlie. Well, this is Andrew Fisher. I'm from the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies. Uh, this is down in Tasmania, Australia. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, working with scientific data sets, um, primarily ocean color and, and sea surface temperature. So these are, um, this is an activity that is, uh, addresses kind of a wide 
um, group of disciplines among students. And what, did I, what I wanted to do was just kind of give you a snapshot of our institute. Um, and if you take a look at the circle on the right-hand side there, you can see the, the general topics that are um, part of our research program and in which students, both undergraduate and graduate, come to study. Um, so the, the, the primary kind of core research areas are uh, in the inside of that circle. It's uh, fisheries and aquaculture, ecology and biodiversity, and then we also have a oceans and, and cryosphere program uh, looking more at general oceanographic issues. Um, kind of the, the disciplinary themes that link those together are, are climate change, ocean and Antarctic governance, and ocean and earth systems. And so this, this activity that I developed was, um, you know, it, it's a fairly good activity to address all of these research topics. And um, what I do is teach it in a uh, third year unit, which is um, kind of a, the final year for our undergraduate students here. However, uh, what we're also going to do is to put this activity into our online uh, repository to and um, have students get access to that along with access to some of the, the, the data portals that we have that researchers post their data onto um, the, the IMAS website. OK, so what um, I'm going to talk about here are the, act, the goals of the activity. Um, and so basically what I have the students do is to uh, begin processing um, ocean color data and sea surface temperature data. So the first thing they need to do is, is go to a website to access the ocean color data um, and temperature data. They download the data. They read that data into MATLAB, um, do some sort of georeferencing of that data. Um, you know, if the data comes with latitude and longitude, then there's usually some matrix manipulation involved with, with the data. And then I ask them to find a, a particular area and cut out that particular area. Of, of, of interest and gather a kind of annual average data set for 13 years for both chlorophyll and temperature. And so that involves uh, many plotting scripts. Uh, and then finally, they, they create a, a batch script for uh, processing many of those files um, as they go. So what I'm going to do now is take you to the, uh, the website. And this is the Ocean Color website. And um, just so you can see here, here's the Ocean Color web. The, the link is provided uh, in the materials. And it's simply easy just to Google Ocean Color Web uh, and get to this website here. There's, there's lots of interesting information about um, ocean color in general in this, in this group at NASA. They have a nice daily image, as you can see, of the Pacific Northwest there. Um, and under here, under data, they have um, a variety of, of data sets that you can access. Um, so I'll just show you here. This is the. Uh, the Level 3 browser, this is a, a gridded image for um, a variety of different data sets, uh, global coverage. And here you can see kind of monthly data for uh, this satellite here, which is the, uh, the Veers satellite. So there's a whole bunch of different kind of data that you can access um, through this website. Now, if I go back, uh, what I typically do is have the students go directly to the direct data access. And this is a little cryptic, but I, I kind of guide them through the process. We'll go to MODIS Aqua satellite, and we'll grab the, the, the map data 
which is, is nicely gridded. And we'll start out with the annual averages. We'll go to uh, four kilometer resolution. And here's a, a series of, of variables that you can download. We'll look at chlor A, um, which is chlorophyll concentration in the surface at uh, a global scale. So these are our annual global averages which they go ahead and, and download onto their, their computer to work with in, in MATLAB. Okay, so I'm, Alice, I can get back to the slides. Okay, so th th that's the, uh, the data access component. Um, the link is provided here. Here's a, a snapshot of, of the website. And um, so then now that they have the material and uh, they start going through the activity, I provide them with uh, some background material and links to remote sensing, uh, what ocean color is, and some information about net CDF file formats. So these are um, scientific data formats that are um, a lot of data sets use this, this file format, so they become familiar with the net CDF format. And then I, I lead them through kind of step-by-step -step instructions at the command line of, of how to read in these net CDF files, how to manipulate the matrices, how to index the matrix and subset the matrix, and then plot this with uh, MATLAB. And so the, the good thing is that MATLAB has all of these, these functions in its standard package. Um, so here are some of the commands that we use, um, ncdisp, ncread, um, flip up, down, image sc, set, title, y label. So all right there in MATLAB, easy to use uh, for the students. And then step three, we, um, I send them through an exercise of, of creating the loops for, for batch processing of these files. So we have a, a basically one for loop and a, an, an if condition statement. And so they're led through that process. And then finally, as, as their own task, they need to go back and, and get the sea surface temperature data and download the sea surface temperature data and, and repeat this process themselves to get the same plot. Um, and so this is what the plot looks like. This is the, the ocean color data um, from 2002 through 2015. This is an uh, annual average for the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand. And during the class, then, we, we begin kind of discussion of the, the, the physical processes, the, the biology in this ocean, or the sea, and um, also some of the issues with, with the ocean color data. Um, as you can see, there's a very high concentration of, of ocean color along the coast, which may not necessarily be from, from phytoplankton, but uh, could be from things like suspended sediments and so forth. Um, so as part of their exercise, they'll kind of write up a description of, of what they see in the data set um, and try to link that to kind of other physical processes that might be occurring in, in this region. OK, so let me uh, move on to, to why. Um, you know, why do I do this, and, and, and why do we use MATLAB for this, um, and possibly why you might want to use this exercise or this activity. Um, so it's kind of a, a simple name, and it, it's easy to grasp. So there's, you know, we're looking at scientific data sets. Uh, we can get these data sets uh, freely online, and they're available from NASA. Once students understand the net CDF format and how to get this data, they can um, go and get a whole bunch of other data sets. And it's, it's a good kind of training for them when they get into kind of the graduate programs and, and need oceanographic data. They need data to understand how um, the ocean changes or, or why fish or other ecological changes occur in, in the coastal environment. Um, and the, the, the nice thing also is that these functions are, are available in MATLAB. Um, so we have a, a 
site license, the students can get a, a student license and um, for free through our university. All of the functions that I've described are, are freely available in that standard package. And lastly, I think this, this um, exercise sets them up for kind of more sophisticated analysis. So they, they understand how to get the data. They can read it into MATLAB. And now they're thinking about what's happening. OK, well, how can we link the biological changes in those color images to um, some physical forcing or climactic phenomena? So we can you know, then jump into principal component analysis and also look at um, spectral analysis as well. All right. Well, thanks, Andy. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry, you've got one more. Go to sorry. It. Oh, I just yeah, here's a, a link of, of resources, which I think Monica is putting up as we speak anyway. Um, so I'll hand it off to Jackie then. I'm interrupting Jackie. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I see there are two questions. One person, Amber, is asking how many credits, and I think she may be asking about all of the courses you guys are talking about. And Jim is asking how many classes or hours are you covering, um, Andy, with your with your activity? Do you want to go okay, first, Andy? I'll, I'll type that in. Oh, uh, okay. do you want me to answer right, here, or should I just type it? You can type it. Okay. Well, while people okay. are typing those answers, I'll go ahead and just keep the ball rolling and we can have a conversation going on in the chat window if that's um, a helpful way to do that. Um, yes. So again, this is Jackie and um, the activity that I'll talk about actually uses a lot of the things that you've just heard from the other two. Um, for example, uh, Andy mentioned the use of, of spectral analysis. I'll talk a little about that. All of these um, activities I think have in common the use of real data of, you know, be they real maps or data that can be downloaded. And so I will also talk about uh, the utility of MATLAB and accessing real data. Um, so this is a project that I teach that focuses on, as you can see from the title, signal processing and seismology. And it was inspired by the paper that you see here um, on the screen written by um, West et al. published in uh, 2006, I think 2006, 2005, something like that. Um, and this has to do with triggering of local earthquakes from the passage of surface waves from the Sumatra earthquake of 2004. Um, and the objectives of this uh, project are to have students use real data via MATLAB to take these data from the 2004 earthquake, to do some basic signal processing on those data and look at earthquake power spectra, and basically to go through a lot of the processes that are described in this paper and then eventually review that paper and see how their observations compare to what came in that article. Um, so just a little background for the class. So this is a class that is a stacked class partly of upper division undergraduates and partly of um, master students. So we have kind of a range of backgrounds. As a consequence, some of the students have not had math beyond calculus. Some may have, some may have had math through differential equations. But teaching a seismology class with a variety of quantitative backgrounds can be challenging. So while we do do some theory in the class, we also focus a lot on sort of data analysis. And MATLAB is a nice sort of equalizer in that, that once they have the scripts and the functions that can tackle some of these more challenging things, everyone's able to use those at the same level. So before they do this activity, students have learned, again, some basic seismological theory. They, have, um, they should be able to identify different seismic phases, so identify the difference between you know, body waves, PNS waves, and surface waves. Um, we will have discussed seismometry, so different types of instrumentation. Um, this project, as you'll see in a second, really emphasizes the fact that one of the seismometers that recorded these data is a short period instrument and thus doesn't see the low frequency waves that the others do. Um, the others are broadbands, and so they have to learn to identify that. We will have talked by this point about binary data, about how to read digital data into MATLAB. Um, you know, Charlie, excuse me, Andy mentioned earlier in the webinar the challenges students have understanding things like directory structure. Similarly, it turns out that they're not often very familiar with sort of how binary data are structured. So we talk a bit about that, and then they have the opportunity to work with some of those data 
Um, I actually download data from IRIS, from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology for the Data Management Center. Um, and so those data come in a pretty standard seismological format, SAC format. But they have ex gained experience then in working with those data. A lot of what we do um, kind of prior to this, we talk about, again, how to graph data and the use of the date number format to plot time so that they can understand what happens if they have a time series that starts, say, one minute before midnight and you have to switch into another day. We talk about some basic signal processing, so the concept of the Fourier transform, I provide them with scripts um, to do that analysis so they don't do the actual <laughs> writing of the Fourier transform program, but they understand how, in theory, they understand how to use it, and then how to calculate power spectra. So these are all things that we tackle um, on when we go, uh, you know, before we get to this activity. Um, so there are a couple of outcomes I'll quickly describe. Um, there is a, um, so there are outcomes with respect to the seismology. So again, their ability to identify the difference between body and surface wave. The ability, again, to calculate a power spectrum. Um, we talk a lot about filtering prior to this. And so this is their opportunity to use those filters and to identify high frequency and low frequency waves. And again, to identify the difference between how two different seismometers will record the same data. From a MATLAB perspective, um, some of the outcomes involve, again, plotting data as a function of both you know, absolute time and relative time, um, understanding how to read in binary data and work with the metadata that come with that that are in structure array format, so they can query that structure array to get information such as the name of the station or the channel on which the data were recorded. And then to overlay and compare these different data sets, so to actually look at two different versions of the same data and see what that tells them about the data themselves. From a quantitative analysis standpoint, from the computer skills analysis, again, as we mentioned before, they have to work with an understanding of directory structure, where they <coughs> put their data, um, how they find their scripts, how to tell MATLAB where to find those things. This can help with that structure. And again, with the idea of plotting against time, sometimes students struggle with the difference of simply plotting a vector where each value on the x-axis is just the index of that vector. This is sample number one, sample number two, sample number three, as opposed to saying, well, this is time one or time zero, this is time 0.01 seconds, this is time 0.02 seconds, et cetera, versus this is noon, you know, this is noon in one second. So having them understand really what they're plotting and that there are two axes even if one of them is a linear um, progression. And then finally, the ability to interpret the data. What does this graph actually tell them about these processes? Um, so just a little briefly what this project actually is. And again, all of this is downloadable from the website that Lisa showed you. Um, this shows just a, a brief map of, um, of the area in question, which is sort of south central Alaska. And you know, here are two of the stations that we use here, PAX and HARP. These are broadband stations. And then there's a cluster of instruments on Mount Wrangell, which is a volcano in the, uh, and sort of located in this region. These are where all these stations are. And the three uh, time series that they plot right away are shown here. The two from stations HARP and PAX that look fairly similar. And then this really different looking one on station Wank, which is on Wrangell. And you can see that these data all start at the same time. They cover the same time frame, but obviously look quite different. And so the first question the students are confronted with is why the same signal, having traveled the same distance, having been recorded on three very proximal instruments, look so different from one another. Um, so the next thing they do is filter those data. And so I have them low pass filter the data from Wank so they can see that, in fact, if you get rid of the high frequency signals and just bring out the low, that, in fact, it looks fairly similar to the broadbands. And so this is their opportunity to consider what it means to filter data and why this stuff looks different than the other. So on that same note, they also calculate a power spectrum. And so we have here the spectral content of those three signals. And again, the students analyze why these might be different at what it tells them. They can see here, um, I don't actually, in this particular project, go into instrument response correction. So the, the amplitudes are actually not quite as meaningful as um, one would like them to be. Instead, what I have them focus on is relative amplitude. 
so that on the two broadband stations shown in blue and red, that the amplitude of the low frequency signal is um, you know, this much higher than the high frequencies. And the high frequencies drop off quite rapidly, showing that these signals really are much, much stronger than those high frequency ones. In contrast, on this station, it still shows those low frequency signals, but in a relative sense, it's not much stronger than the high frequencies. And that turns out to be simply because this instrument is not very effective at recording uh, long period events or long period signal, so it really muffles it. And that's why it looks different. But then if they filter it, they can bring this peak out and show that it looks like the other stations. So hopefully that gives them a sense for what filtering gets them. And finally, they overlay the filtered and the unfiltered data from that station on the volcano. And this figure is very similar to the one that's shown in the West et al. science paper. And I have them zoom in on the data um, that are here. They can zoom in on the first surface waves and see that these very short period signals come right with the passing of the surface waves. And in fact, again, as noted in the paper, they come you know, sort of in pulses that coincide with the arrival of those waves. So that they're able to zoom in and see the correlation between those two uh, components of that, of that one seism um, seismogram. I'll point out that sometimes I'm amazed that students really struggle to zoom in on the data. Um, I think this speaks to some of the concerns they have about sort of ruining their data in some way. They're very reluctant to zoom in, or, or, to, or they'll zoom in much too closely. And this actually turns out to be a whole skill in identifying what you want in a frame and how different an image looks if you focus on it in different ways. Um, the final thing we do once they've done this is they read that paper. They read the paper by West et al. And they compare their results to what was um, described in the article. And it's a way for them to understand that they can do the same things as these scientists, or at least they can plot those same data. They can see where those analyses came from. And I think it's a way that they can kind of wrap their heads around the scientific process and help to understand what the article is telling them in a way that simply reading it might not have. Um, so I think that's all I've got. I can see there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat window, which is terrific, because we're going to move here into this question and answer period. Um, and so I want to know if, Lisa, maybe you want to kind of pick some of those questions to, to bring up or take it from here. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, well, it looks like we're having a dialogue. I think we've mostly answered the questions. Um, what is going on, there's been some questions about data formats that MATLAB supports and how do you do conversion between different data formats. And now we're talking about DEM data. And I guess I'll mention, even though it's it maybe only Hassan who's asking, but one thing we haven't really covered today is that there's a whole mapping capability in MATLAB. So there's a mapping toolbox. And so uh, Jackie did a nice job covering signal processing. And um, and uh, Andy talked about HDF and NetCDF, but we didn't actually say out loud that uh, MATLAB has mapping functionality. And so um, one of the things you'll, first of all, what I was going to just mention is if you want to find out if something's in MATLAB, just type it into Google. Type MATLAB, whatever you're looking for. So if you want to know MATLAB DEM map, type that in. And you'll generally end up with a documentation page that has the answer. Um, and so the things that we're answering here in the chat, I bet you would find in one in one search in Google. So that's my recommendation to you. And we've set up our pages so that they can be easily findable on the MathWorks site. You may find other things like CERC pages or things from professors who have posted, you know, exercises for their students or community toolboxes that are available. There are a lot of community uh, toolboxes written for mapping, for example. So you and seismology is another great example. There are toolboxes for seismology that have been written by the the community that are free and open source. But again, um, you can certainly reach out to any of us after the webinar. But but again, I recommend if you're looking for something, you might just want to search on Google. But um, uh, so I think we're all set on the questions that I've seen so far. If there are any more, please type them in. I do want to thank uh, Charlie, Andy, and Jackie. Great job, and those are great activities. And as we said, if you go to those resource pages, you'll see not just these activities, which are written in long form, not just slides, but written out all the way, meaning uh, you know, prose description of them, including pointers to the, the data sources that they're using and, and code. So if Andy, Jackie, and Charlie had code that they were using in the class, if the students typed or, or uh, cut and pasted, that code is also there. Um, 
Okay, so um, there is a new question. Yeah, Lisa, can I chime in for a sec? This is Jackie, and this is yeah. partly in response to the question that Jim just posted, but I see this asked before. Um, first of all, I want to address sort of an early question. Somebody asked about how much MATLAB people have had prior to these classes, mm -hmm. and I think that's an important question. So I wanted that's to good. point out that um, the prerequisite for my seismology class is my introduction to geophysics class, which is the class in which I introduce MATLAB. So most of my students have relatively little experience with it. They do, um, we do weekly problem sets in the geophysics class where they use it. This is the first class in which they use it in more detail. So that sort of, um, uh, you know, the background that they've got. Um, Jim asked about whether, you know, <laughs> how well they understand, you know, the, the time domain versus the frequency domain, and I will totally agree with you, Jim. I'm not completely sure that they know what they're looking at. Um, I think what I have them do a lot, and I do this with both equations and graphs, is I have them, once they plot something, they have to write in prose what it is that they're seeing. So they have to be able to describe in written language, not simply, you know, graphically, you know, I see that the strongest amplitude in this signal is at this frequency. The higher frequencies drop off rapidly. That tells me that there's less energy contained there. You know, something like that, but that I try to have them voice in words what that process is and not simply rely on the graphics. I think they have to combine both of those skills. Um, anyway, I just want to tackle those two things. I don't know if um, Andy yeah, or Yeah, and J Charlie Jackie, if I can. Yeah, I, I do something similar. So they have to process the chlorophyll and the temperature, but they can do it, but what does it mean? So they have to write a brief description of, of what's happening over time and then, you know, find some information, perhaps even articles that describe the patterns they see in those, those ocean color and, and temperature images. But I think it's a great so question. It's of, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I mean, it's just this exercise, this is part of a, it, it's part of a class, so it kind of feeds into a, a larger project that they're working on during the semester. Right, but I think yeah, it's a great I, question. How do you order signal processing, math, computation, by which I mean programming and, and, and also learning a specific language, and what's the right order and combination of those so that the students learn all of those? I think that's definitely a question. Yeah, and, and I agree. I have yeah. I have a whole course where the students learn MATLAB, but they don't just learn MATLAB for programming sake. It's about working with data and and doing some some math. And it can be simple. Like for example, I have one exercise where they get time distance data for for the Hawaiian hotspot chain, and um, and then they basically have to find out well how can we make that into a velocity for the Pacific plate. And so they basically then have to fit the line and do that in MATLAB, but then also like write a, write a paper out of that, why they did it. So I think, I think it really needs to go together, the programming and the, and the quantitative skill with it, and, and also the verbal, like the communication. <clears throat> So Jim's, Jim's asking a question about the assessment. What I wanted to do to answer his question, and we only have a few more minutes, is actually go back to the teaching activity and actually look at Andy's teaching activity, and he explains how he assesses the students. And I thought it would be interesting to see that that kind of information is actually contained on the site, perhaps not from every activity, but for one. Um, uh, I, I can't. Sorry, so the chat contains all the resources for uh, teaching geoscience with MATLAB. If you look at the chat, you'll see a lot of links. But um, so if that's okay, I'm going to um, unshare. I can't quite forget how. Stop sharing. Okay. And sharing my screen. Hang on, it's coming. All right, I guess I have to go back again. Right, so uh, so here's the teaching activities. Hopefully you guys can see this. And it says view collection. And I'm going to go specifically to the teaching activity that Andy just covered. And you see how he says, you know, you see learning goals and all this. And then it says assessment. And it says grading rubric. 
so excited. I get to show the grading rubric. And, uh, uh oh, uh, but I think it's exactly Jim's question, right? So, what I saw the other day, <laughs> if you get a correct answer, you only get a 50%. That's no fun. Uh, okay, so there are other things. Demonstration of critical thinking, right? So uh, you guys can all argue amongst yourselves whether Andy did it right or whether there are other ways to do it that are better. But I think the point is Andy's taking into account it's not just about handing in the code, like Jim was saying. It's not just about, um, you know, getting the right answer. Uh, what were you doing? And that's what Jackie's talking about also with providing... Um, you know, providing prose description. So maybe there are better ways than that. But but you see here that Andy's Andy's requiring more than more than just doing it to um to to have consider them to have succeeded at the task. Okay. But so. I, I think I do think you know these points are really a good one. That simply turning in a graph is not necessarily a strong indication that the students have learned. You know, ha have really accomplished what we hope they will. Is a really it requires some additional critical thinking and demonstration of understanding beyond. You know, it's simply the goal, you know, there, there are certain times when what I want to see is that they know how simply to make a graph. And, and there's some value in that when they're first learning, you know, be it MATLAB or any kind of, of um, you know, way to, dem to visualize data. Um, so if the goal is simply to say, do you know how to make this graph? Can you make a subplot? Can you make a, a three-dimensional image like this? There's some value in that. But if the goal is to have them use that to interpret and analyze data, then there's really kind of, I think, has to be a, a second portion of the assignment that requires that analysis. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to keep us on schedule here. So. Uh... Monica says that all the activity pages are set up with an assessment section, meaning that people who submit activities in theory would provide similar information to what Andy showed. But you get the idea. It isn't, yeah, what, it, what Jackie said. It's not as simple as just handing it in. So I'm going to keep going. So if you have more questions, um, you know where to find us. The people's names are posted on the, uh, well, the participants list from the workshop, but also probably associated with the teaching activity. So Unfortunately or unfortunately, you can find us if you want to. So um, please, please feel free to reach out to the community or join the community, which I'll talk about in a second. Look at that. Um, so you can join the community. You can go to the page, um, and maybe Monica will post. Yeah, posted that she just did. Um, and you can go here, and it says join the community. Where's my little guy? I can't find my guy. Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, so. Click there. You'll join the community, and you can see there are these conversations. Some people said nine things about intro videos. Some people said six things. Some people didn't answer somebody. Maybe she was just giving information. Um, so come ask a question. Tell what you're using. Ask things like you're asking here, and get the community talking to itself about how best to do this. That's exactly what we're going for. Okay. Um, and uh, another thing that's happening is um, people are continuing to spread the gospel after the workshop. So Jackie, who we just heard from, will be giving another presentation at the Earth Educators Rendezvous. Um, there'll, be a, there'll be a talk from three other workshop participants, including Andy, at AGU. And I just heard from Anantha Iyer, who's from um, North Carolina State today, uh, that he will, in fact, be, he has, has or will today submit uh, to the American Meteorological Society. And then there's another workshop coming up, which will be <coughs> Beyond just geoscience, will include all the sciences. And I saw there are some people here today who were supposed to attend the workshop who are not just geoscientists. So maybe you'd like to consider attending that. Um, so again, uh, resources. Um, there's the main page that t that's a tool sheet for MATLAB at the high level. Talks about things like auto grading and other th other things, books, etc. You don't just have to be a teacher. Re researchers would benefit from this as well. But then there are the specific uh, circ page, uh, specific items, the teaching activities like the ones you saw today, but more beyond that, the overall philosophy, and it kind of ties back to some of these questions we're talking about. How do you teach programming? When do you teach programming? Why do you teach programming? Those are great questions, right? And then you can join the community and ask those questions. And like I said, there's this nav here that would help you, um, you know, find your way, find your way around over here. Um, you know, so if you get to the any one of these pages, you can you can um, browse through using some of this navigation and, and find what you're looking for. Um, uh, okay, so that's I think that's all we had. So thank you so much to everybody um, who was here uh, today to present, especially 
well, Jackie, Andy, and and uh, and Charlie, but also Monica and Alice and everybody else from Cirque who helped do this. Um, I could talk to Amber offline, which she's asking about, but if anybody, I don't know if people have to go, but if people want to stick around or Amber wants to stick around, I'm happy to talk um, more if that's okay with Alice and Monica. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Um, all right, you want to keep going? All right, so um, we can stay and talk to you. Other people, I think, are welcome to go. We're, people are dropping off, you can see. Amber. Um, um, Lisa, I mean, I'm happy. Sorry? Oh, I'm, I'm just, um, just to let the participants know I'm, I'm happy to kind of communicate them with them individually by email or, or however they want to talk um, and share more experiences and, and the activities okay. as well and kind of the, the rationale right. behind yep, same thing here. the activities. All right, so I'll actually address Amber's question to whoever's left. Amber, one of the things we're trying really hard to do is to make MATLAB accessible at basically all universities. I understand you don't have a site license. We're trying to do that increasingly. And even for two-year colleges and community colleges, we're looking to figure out how to make it available to you, to you um, for the number of people who would use it. So in your case, that's a smaller number. And, um, and so um, I'd love to speak to you. If you could email me after. Um, uh, I we don't think we put emails in here, but it, but it's probably on the site. But if you want to just email me at Lisa K L I S A K at MathWorks dot com, we can talk about this, and I could probably get you to some people here who might be able to help you. Um, the idea is that it would be easy to access MATLAB um, from lots of university sites, and it really is MathWorks mission to do that. And and we have hundreds, almost a thousand site licenses now, and our goal is to get everybody one. So um, so. That's something we're working on, okay? Anything else? I don't think there are any other questions. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to say there's an evaluation form. Um, <laughs> you can see the link there. So please fill out the eval. We'd love to know what everybody thought. And, um, you know, uh, probably you'll see it in your email as well, and we'll send an email to you with um, all the uh, the screencast information because this has been recorded, and you'll be able to get access to everything we did today. Uh, but do send out, do uh, fill out, excuse me, the email form so that we can know um, what to do differently next time. Okay. <laughs>